recording. And here's the module. But before we go there, I'm going to go back to the circuit that we talked about last time. Okay. And this class benefits from you know being lagging behind by um, about one class session compared to the Tuesday, Thursday, because we got last Monday as a holiday. So as a result, we are actually behind the Tuesday, Thursday class, even though we started first. Which is not bad, okay, because you know, we can actually benefit um, because you know the um, the logic sim file that I created from last time, you know, I don't have to recreate it in this class, and we can just take a look at it. So let me go back to uh, Canvas first and go to announcements, and here we go. Okay, so I posted this on. September 7th, um, to remind people you know, what we are going to talk about today. And it is important to read the modules ahead of time, take notes, and you know, write down your questions as we go over the content of the module. And last time, I believe you know, that was Monday, you know, I also gave you the file, um, which is the 3x3 or 3 by 3 adder subtractor so that you have some time to actually look at the circuitry and see how that relates to the material that we have already talked about in binary addition and subtraction. Okay, so are there any questions regarding the circuit? I am assuming that you guys have taken a look, okay, because if it's not useful in this class, I would not have given it to you. So are there any questions about that? Okay, no questions? All right. <clears throat> um, I'm going to bring it up anyway because there is one additional circuit that I made into that file. Okay, let me resize this here because I sometimes open it a little bit too big on this particular screen. It's a little too big. Smaller, there we go. All right, so I think that's about right. Okay, so let me open that file again. Um, because, you know, one thing you can do with this particular file is you can just run it with a binary addition or subtraction. If I were to ask you to perform a 3-bit by 3-bit subtraction, do you feel confident that you can do it? Okay, I see some nods, okay? Nods, okay, a few, I see a few nods. But if you're not confident about doing that, then you probably want to learn how to do it, okay? Um, the entire topic of binary addition and subtraction is about how to perform binary subtraction and binary addition. So if you're practicing and you're not really sure whether your answer is right or not, this circuit can help you verify whether your answer is right or not, okay? Um, so that's a, it's a tool, okay, for that purpose. It works on both addition and also subtraction. So that means, you know, you can use it for, to practice your both addition and subtraction in base two. I can only tell you that the test or the first exam of this class is going to be quite heavy in terms of, you know, understanding the mechanisms of binary addition and subtraction. And it is also not in a very prescribed format. You actually have to use troubleshooting techniques you know, to answer some of those questions. So being, a, being able to practice and verify that you have a good understanding of the material is really, really important. All right, so that's that. Um, and then, you know, this, there's a different circuit here. It is, it's a very simple circuit. I call it Toadie. Because this is you know, basically bitwise, this is a two's complement. It also illustrates what is one's complement. So we'll talk about this today. Okay. So if you are thinking, oh, I know what is one's complement. I know what is two's complement because I read the signed versus unsigned in the module already, and I kind of get an idea of what it is. Great. Okay. Because you know that means you know, you have already pre-read the module at least to the point that you have encountered. And remember that you have encountered the terms of one's complement versus two's complement. Okay, 
that is kind of what I'm expecting. Okay, you know, is people have already read the module before class, so that they have a general idea of what I'm going to talk about. Maybe have some questions about the technic technical side of how things are derived, and also the math background of you know the um, talk of the uh, of the module. So I'm repeating all of this stuff here. Okay, repeat you know, again and again because it is important. Okay, because if you're going if you're studying in a four-year university, that is also what your professors would expect you to do. Because those classes go faster than my classes. All right. So what we're going to do is we are going to talk about um, signed versus unsigned integer representation. Um, the first thing is, why do we need to do that? We already know how to represent um, values, okay, you know, uh, because of the base conversion module. So from the base conversion module, let me just kind of test whether you guys know how to do this or not. Um, let me see if dropping is already up. If it's not, I can start it. So I'll give you a few cases of, you know, you can tell me what you know, each one is representing. So there we go. <clears throat> um, Joplin. Okay, so I'm pulling Joplin into the onto the projected projected side, and I'm going to go to CISP three ten. This is section one two 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 zero. So I'm going to go to notes here and make a new one for today. So it is oh okay, this two thousand twenty four oh nine. Today is the eleven. Okay, there we go. And then hide these two. Okay, so I'm going to give you a binary number, and you tell me what value it is representing. Uh, we'll start with something simple, like this. Okay, you can focus on the right-hand side. So what is that binary number representing? What value is it representing? Okay, we got the right answer here. It is representing the quantity of two. Okay, so that's pretty easy. Um, and let's take a look at another one, and then we'll move forward with the stuff that we are going to talk about today. What about this one? One one zero one. Yes. Oh, sure, absolutely. Let me go to. I think the control plus here should work here. There we go. A little better. Okay. Um, you can also consider sitting kind of up more up front here. You know, that way, your your distance is uh, shorter to the screen. All right, so what about 1101? What do you think is the value being represented by the binary number of 1101? Go ahead. It is not 9. It's 13, okay? So how do we get to 13? Because this is how we read numbers. It doesn't matter what the base is, because, okay, I know some of you are going to say, check, don't say that again. I'm going to say it again. Each digit is representing the quantity of a power of the base, you know, and the exponent is dictated by the position of the digit. Okay? Um, if every time I say this, I put a quarter in the jar, I'll be a rich man. <laughs> if, you, if you understand what I just said, that's good. Okay? That means you have been paying attention and you're already counting 10. This is like the fifth time you say this. On the other hand, for people who are going like, I have no idea what you're talking about, I would be very concerned at this point in the class. Anyway, so this one is telling us how many 2 to the power of 0 we can have, because this is digit 0. This is telling us that we have none of 2 to the power of 1. Well, 2 to the power of 1 is just 2, so we don't have 2. This one is telling us that we have 1 of 2 to the power of 2, Oh, excuse me, this is 2 to the power of 1, this is 2 to the power of 2, and 2 to the power of 2 is 4, we have 1 of 4, and this is 1 of 8. So we just have to add up 8, 4, and 1, and they add up to 13. Is that okay? So that's kind of the basics of base conversion. But because of that equation, okay, so let me kind of quote the equation here. Um, you can probably just kind of go back to the notes and find it too. So the equation... Um, that I used here 
is i going from, um, in this case, I'll just you know, going from zero to um, you know, some number w minus one. W is the width of the integer. So this time I'm not going to go for negative infinity to positive infinity because you know, I just want to work with, like in this case, W equals to four because you know, W is the width of the integer. In, in both of the examples for today, the width is four. Okay, there are four bits or four digits. And then what we are summing would be digit I, okay? which is basically saying, okay, digit zero, digit one, digit two, digit three, times, okay, and I'm going to use a uh, dot here. Oh, it doesn't like that, okay. Oh, because of the space, it doesn't like this extra space at the end. So times two to the power of, okay, now we can do the space, two to the power of i. Does that look familiar to you? Maybe not exactly the same, but you know, I think we have talked about this particular sigma notation a few times already. So when you look at this you know, sigma notation, is there a chance that we can represent negative values? No, there's not a single chance that we can, be, we can represent negative values because the digits are always non-negative. Right? Because the digits in base 2 are either a 0 or a 1. There's no negative 1. What about the powers of 2? Well, the power of 2 can never be negative anyway. Okay? Because you know, it doesn't matter whether it's 2 to the power of negative something, because that just makes a fraction, but it is still non-negative. So that means when you look at the summation of each, of each one of these terms, there's no way we can represent negative values. So are we good with that? Are we understanding you know, this is good, it is useful, but what about negative values? We cannot represent negative values this way. So what we are going to talk about today is, so if this is not going to help us to represent negative values, how do we actually represent negative values? So are we understanding the context of today's lecture, the main point? Okay. And we already know that computers can do that because in C++, okay, in a previous class in CISP 360, there was the distinction between the unsigned type, which can only represent non-negative values, versus int, which can represent both negative and positive integers. So we know that the computer can do it. The question is, how does it do it? Yes. You're correct. The most significant bit is known as the sign bit in a signed integer encryption representation. All right, so these are the questions, okay? <clears throat> so I'm going to go back to my notes here and kind of move on to the math part, okay? So the math part, the first one is we have a finite bit width. What does that mean? What is a bit width? You already know it because you know, when we you know, talked about the, uh, the input pins and the output pins in all the largest in projects that we have done so far, there's a bit width, okay? You have to specify the number of bits of an input pin, of an output pin, or whatever component you're actually trying to, make, uh, trying to use in the middle. So in this case, you know, the bit width is corresponding to how many binary digits are we assigning to the representation of integers. Okay? And this is where mathematicians and computer science people would disagree. Because if you ask your math professor and you ask, what is the largest integer? The math professor will look at you and go like, there's no such thing as the largest integer. Because let's just say that this value x, whatever it is, is the largest. Then the next question is, what about x plus 1? Ah, oh, OK, one, x plus 1 is a little bit bigger than x. It is also an integer. So there's no way you can define the largest integer in a mathematics class. But this is not a math class, this is computer science. So in a computer science class, integers as a type has a fixed width, which means as a char, it is confined to eight bits. Um, usually short int is confined to 16 bits. 
depending on the architecture, int itself is either 32 or 64 bits. And then you can also have long, long int, which can be up to 128 bits. Okay? 128 bits is a lot of zeros and ones, right? But is it finite? Yep, it is still finite. So as long as the number of bits is finite, there's a largest thing it can represent and there's a smallest thing it can represent. If I were to switch back to this here, and this time, you know, I make, you know, okay, so focus on the right-hand side. So if, in this case, if I specify, okay, if I specify that W equals to 64, which is fairly common, you know, to have 64-bit integers in a modern architecture, what is the largest value that can be represented by a 64-bit number? How do we figure that out? It doesn't have to be a super fast way to figure it out. Tell me you know, a way, just one way, to figure out what is the largest value, unsigned, that you can represent using 64 bits. Only using things that are on the screen already. So you don't have to kind of go like, okay, what is the trickiest way to do this? Nope, just use the things that we have talked about so far. How, how would you go about doing it? Yep. Hmm? Um, you mean two to the power of W? Yeah, W is the width. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, so, so are you? Are, I was looking at this one. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. So there's W here and there's I over here. So the way you can figure that out is, oh, okay. For each digit in the base two number, what are my choices? In base two, what are my what are my choices for my digits? Zero and one. Zero and one. Very good. And which one is the larger one? One. Okay, very good. So that means you know, the largest value coming out of this sigma notation is having all the D of I's being ones. Okay, so now what are we looking at? So now we are looking at, um, okay, so we'll go, I'll go ahead and make this here. So we'll say the largest value unsigned oops, is one because you know that's one times two to the power of zero plus two plus four whoops plus four plus a plus blah 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 okay does that make sense to you the question is when do we stop oh i know when when we're going to stop because we're going to stop when i equals to w minus one so if that is the case you know, i can just you know, go ahead and specify that when we stop we are looking at 2 to the power of w minus 1. Okay, and w is supposed to be lowercase. So change that to, whoops, lowercase, whoops, or caps lock, that's right. There we go. Is that okay? So given that we are only using 64 bits, that means we are adding 1, 2, 4, 8, all the way up to to the power of 63. Okay? And that value, you know, I'm not going to give you the actual mathematical proof. That value turns out to be just your know, 2 to the power of w, the whole thing minus 1. Okay? I'm not going to show you the actual proof to show you that this summation always add up to just you know, 2 to the power of w whole thing minus one. Are we good so far? Knowing the range of a of an integer with w bits, it can only go up to that specific specific value. Are we okay? Can you say the double bits? Hmm? You say the yeah, bits? w is the width of the integer, which means you know, that the number of bits that we use to represent the integer. So in this case, okay, we are also using just four bits over here. So when we plug in W equals to four, that means we can only represent up to and including two to the power of four, which is 16, minus one, which is 15. So 15 is the largest value that we can represent 
when we are only given four bits. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> so getting back to the slide here. So the next thing is, um, you know, what about 19? Can 19 be represented using four bits? So the answer to that question is yes and no. Okay. You know, don't you like those answers? You know, it's yes and no. You know. Well, it's yes and no because it depends on how you look at numbers, how you look at values. So what we'll do next is to define you know, the notion of uh, modulo congruent modulo n. Okay, that's a term that we are going to use at least you know, for this class and also for the next class. So let me say that one more time. Okay, that term is called congruent modulo n. What does that mean? Okay, so we'll go ahead and take a look at the definition. If you look up congruent modulo in Wikipedia, this is the definition. This is a notation. That's all it is. Okay, it is a notation. This is my notation because I don't like to type all that stuff. You know, I just put a subscript of n with three bars. Okay, so it's not an equality. Three bars followed by n as a subscript is saying exactly congruent modulo n. It is just a notation. It does not define what it is. It simply says, when you see this symbol, it means congruent modulo n. But what does it mean? The third bullet point is the definition of what is congruent modulo n. So if we say that A is congruent modulo n B, or A and B are congruent modulo n, it means exactly this, okay? So now we look at this and go like, okay, what does that mean? Well, there's a little bit more to it. For some integers, Ka, Kb, and for some integer B, such that B is between zero and n. It is larger than or greater, is greater than or equal to zero, which means it can start with zero, but it, it cannot be n. It has to be less than n. Okay, so these are the constraints. That is not helpful, is it? Okay, because I just gave you a bunch of symbols, a lot of math stuff, and um, they're fairly abstract. So the best way to understand this is to use an example. So the way we look at this example is to ask the question, is 3 and 19 congruent modulo 16? That's a question. We don't know yet, okay? So in order to answer that question, you substitute the 3 to the A, you substitute the 19 to the B. And then you want to find a value for B so that A equals to B plus blah, blah, and B, B equals to blah, blah, B plus blah, blah. So the best way, the easiest way, is simply to look at you know, 3 and 19 and go like, okay, does, is any one of these numbers between 0 and 16, excluding 16 itself? You go like, yeah, 3 is, right? So if 3 is already between 0 and 16, then we can just say, okay, what about we make Ka equal to 0? Does that make sense? Okay, so just look at this. 3 equals to... 3 plus 0 times 16. That's, is that true? Okay, so that means we have found k of a to make this whole thing true, and we have also found b. So now the next question is, if I look at b as 19, I look at b as 3, I look at n as 16, can I find an integer k of b to make this equality happen? What do you think? We can, yep, and k of b would be, so let me, so this is 19, this is 3, this is 16, so what do you think is k of b? 1, 1, 1, that's right, very good, okay, good job. So that means, because I can find a ka, a kb, they're both integers, right, 0 and 1 are both integers. We can find a b, which is 3, and 3 is between 0 and 16, excluding 16 itself. And once we have all those integers, a does equal to this part, b does equal to this part. This is, by the way, conjunction. Okay, it means n. We can find, we can satisfy both of these requirements. That means you know, this entire conjunction is true, which also means we have just proven that 3 and 19 
are congruent modulo system. Is that okay? Is that example working for you guys? Oh, because we need, to, we need to figure out how to represent negative numbers. Okay, that's a very good question. I'm so glad that you asked that question, okay? The question was, why do we need to look into congruent modulo something, okay? Because it looks kind of stupid, okay? Why do I need to know that three and 19 are congruent modulo 16? In other words, they are the same under certain conditions, okay? When I look at three and 19 in a certain way. So I'm going to ask you one question. Do you think k of b to be negative? Is anything in this definition that excludes negative numbers from being used for either ka or kb? Um, you can add as a negative square. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm just looking at what I have around the home. That's if b is a bigger number than what we have the calculation of kb. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So let me ask you this question. I'm going to switch back to um, Joplin. So I'm going to ask you this question. Okay. So this is a question we need to answer. The question is, um, let me take a look at the example here. If I, I want to use the example that we already have. So I'm going to ask you this. 13, and I cannot remember how I did the, uh, the triple bar. I think it's equiv, but I... Want to be sure, so I mean, yeah, equiv. Okay. So e with, and then underscore, uh, in this case, 16, this and negative 3. So I put a question mark here. Uh, okay, give me a second. We need to fix this because this 16 need to be enclosed in braces. So once again, focus on the left hand side. So now I'm asking, is 13 and negative 3 congruent modulo 69? How can you be sure? Well, we can see that when you plug in those into the translation, it's going to give the negative value. Okay, so so the key here is, okay, so let, let me spell out the entire thought exercise. So in this case, A is 13 and B is negative 3. Is that okay? Unless Because, you put 0. Huh? Unless you put 0. Well, I mean, we'll, 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 we'll work this out, okay? We'll work this out. Okay, but are we agreeing that you know, this question is really asking you know, the same question that we saw earlier, except A is 13 and B is negative 3? Okay, because those are the two numbers that I'm asking. Are these two congruent modulo 16? All right, so also using the same notation as you know, in, the, in the notes, N equals to 16 in this case. Because we're asking are they congruent modulo 16, so the n is 16. The way I'm doing this is I'm asking each of these questions is, okay, what about b? Okay, can we find b? In other words, of the two numbers that we are trying to figure out whether it's congruent modulo 16, is one of these numbers between 0 and excluding 16? You know, in, in other words, from 0 to 15. Which one? 13, right? 13 is be between 0 and 15. Okay, so we can now say, okay, we, we just solved, you know, what B is. It is just 13. So knowing all of these, okay, can I find K of A as a constant? So K of A as a constant is what? Now remember, K of A is um, if we add 13, to k of a times 16, we should get 13 back. What is k of a? Zero. Very good. Okay, we solved that. Is zero an integer? Okay, so, so far so good. So the last step is can we also solve for k of b? So k of b is basically asking, can I find an integer so that 13 plus whatever k of b is times 16 would give me negative 3? So 
So I can, I can also write the equation, so it, it helps to visualize. So we are asking, we got negative 3 on this side. The question is, can I express negative 3 as 13 plus some kind of number, I put a question mark here, times, uh, I will use C dot, uh, 16. Can I solve for that? Negative one, very good, okay, good job. Okay, so you just applied algebra without a piece of paper. That's good, okay, you know, that is good. A sense of number is always helpful in computer science. Okay, so we just solved it, right? We just solved the you know, K of D can be neg is negative one. Okay, so now the question is, is negative one an integer? It is an integer. So that means, oh, oh, so that means we just answer our question over here. 13 and negative 3 are indeed congruent modulo 16. They are, quote unquote, the same when we look at it in a certain way. Is that okay? So are we starting to answer the question that we had earlier? Why is this important? Because now we look at this and go like, hey, I know how to represent 13 in base 2 in, as a binary number, don't we? Okay, Because all you have to do is to, I mean, you cannot see anymore because we scrolled a little bit. Because all we have to do is to go like, oh, but this is 13 as a base 2 number. So if negative 3 is module, congruent module 16, and we are dealing with, you know, um, 16 is the largest value that we can represent using four bits. That means maybe these things are all related. Okay, now I'm not asking you to prove you know, how these things are related at this point. I'm asking you, can you intuitively kind of have all of these pieces and loosely connect to the pieces and go like, okay, so on one hand, we have the 1101 in base two representing the integer of 13. On the other hand, we have, we know that 16 is the large, excuse me, 15 is the largest value that you can represent using uh, four bits, okay? And the last piece is, oh, we have just shown that 13 and negative three are quote unquote the same thing. Oh, all of those pieces seem to be connectable. We are just not really sure about how are they all connected. Are we doing okay so far? So you're saying that for a positive number, there could be a negative, a negative related number. Yep. A bit pattern has no specific thing, has no particular meaning to it. Because 1101 can simply mean on the screen, we have four pixels. One is white, one is black, one is bright, white again, and the other one is also white. Because we don't know what one, uh, 1101 is going to be used for. It can be pixels on the screen, it can be a number, it can be a character, it can be whatever, okay? So all we are so doing here, okay, using this equation is an interpretation of those bits, assuming that we should interpret it in a particular way. Are we doing okay so far? In other words, let me say that one more time. 1101, okay, in that sequence, okay? simply means we have four bits, four binary digits, and the values of those four individual digits in base two are exactly just zero, one, one, zero, one. But what is it representing? We don't know. It can be a pixel. It can be four pixels in a monochrome screen. It can be a lot of things. In other words, the interpretation of those four bits is unknown. We are only asking about how what are the different ways of interpreting those four bits? One way is to look at 1101 as 13. The other way is to interpret 1101 as negative 3. What does the computer know if we use the 16 as the actual value for? For n? Because that is, um, it's 2 to the power of 4. That's why you know, we are using 16. Because the, the width is 4 in this case, 
Okay, let, let me show you this example. I'm going to lower the screen a little bit here because I'm going to draw something on the whiteboard, which also means you know, this is not going to be captured by um, the recorder. Okay, so you might need to kind of write this down. I'll describe you know exactly what it, what I'm drawing, but still, okay, you know, if you just write it down, it might be helpful. And what dropped? Oh. I have no idea where this came from. Okay, so do this. Draw a circle. Okay, because normally your math professor will say integers can be represented using a number line, which extends straight on one side. It also extends straight on the other side. In this class, we deal with number circles, not number lines. Okay, so you draw a circle and then you chop it up into sixteen portions. It's easy to chop things up into sixteen or any powers of two because all you have to do is to divide it by two. We have two now. Now we have four. Now we have eight. And guess what? Now we have six. We get so far. So draw a circle. You go like click. How many slots do we have on this circle? Sixteen. Because we're dealing with four bit numbers. Okay, the width is four bits. So the first thing you do, or first thing I'm going to do, is to represent each slot. Use use the binary bit pattern to represent each slot. So I go like, okay, we'll make this zero, 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 zero. This is zero, 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 one, zero, zero, one, zero. This is going to be what? The next one is? One, one. One, one. Uh-huh, very good. And the next one is? One, one, zero. One, zero, zero. Very good. Okay. So I think you guys are getting the, the general idea of how we work this out. Okay. This is really tedious, okay? And normally I don't do this, but I think it's good to do it at least once. One, 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 zero, and then finally the one, 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 one. Are we doing okay so far with the binary representation of each slot? Is, is there a particular way that I assign you know, the binary numbers to each slot on the wheel? Do you think there's a pattern to it? And if so, what is the pattern? Okay, imagine that you have a, you have an indicator, okay, which can basically rotate around the whole thing, okay? If I rotate clockwise, what is happening? If you look at the number that the pointer is pointing to, and I'm rotating clockwise, what is happening to the number or the value represented by the thing that, that is pointed to by the pointer? It's increasing, it's increasing. Um, you go by two, not today. Uh, <laughs> uh, it better be on time, so this way, you know, it's already, if you just come in and ask the rest of the class. All right, so when we are turning the, in, the pointer clockwise, we are increasing. Is that making any sense? Okay. Because after all, this is one, this is two, this is three, this is four, and so on. What about counterclockwise? If I start pointing here to begin with, this is six, and now I point to here, and this is what? Five. So counterclockwise means decreasing, clockwise means increasing. Are we good so far? Okay. So we look at this and go like, okay, so if I were to use, let me use green here, to assign the interpretation of each bit pattern, well, that's pretty easy. I think zero, 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 representing zero is not difficult to no one's going to challenge that. This is one, this is two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm going to stop here. Okay, the reason why I stop here is like, um, what about this slot over here? What is it representing? Think about it, okay? This is zero. And then I turn it backwards, and you guys told me that turning counterclockwise is decreasing. 
Yes? Because what your response was recorded. <laughs> you guys cannot go back and say, oh, we didn't say that. Yes, you said that. Okay, counterclockwise is decreasing. So what do you get counterclockwise when it was pointing to zero to begin with? And now we point to the one, 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 one. You get negative one. There we go. So now we have just found a way to go like, oh, so this is one way to interpret a bit pattern to negative values. Because we are no longer looking at 1111 as 15. We're looking at 1111 as negative. Gonna, I'm going to pause a little bit here because I think this might need a little bit of time for you guys to think about and potentially ask some questions about it. I can imagine some questions in, I cannot read minds, fortunately, <laughs> but I can imagine there are some questions. Yes. So in that case, you're going to have 0 to 15 labeled green, and you're going to have negative 1 to negative 16 labeled up. Okay. Very good. Okay. But I can imagine someone is going to have a question, okay, which is, um, so what do we know about 1, 1, 1, 1? Because it can be negative 1, but we can also, okay, I don't have a, another color. Okay, let me see if I can actually find another color. That would be good. Blue, that's right. Okay. So we now ask, but what about 15? If we use that slot for negative 1, then what happens to 15? This is why we talk about congruent modulo. Okay, because 15 and negative 1 are, quote unquote, the same thing. In other words, 15 congruent modulo 16 with negative 1 is true. They can share the same spot, not a problem. Okay, but the question is still remaining, which is, so which one is it? Okay, because we only got one bit pattern, which is 1, 1, 1, 1. So is it negative 1 or is it 15? Okay, I can see some of you are having that question in your head. Okay, so my response to that question is completely insensitive, which is, what do you care? <laughs> okay, but really, what do you care? Why do you need to know whether 1111 is representing negative 1? or whether it is representing 15. Let me illustrate why it really does not matter in some cases. So we'll do some calculations, okay? Um, I, can use, oh, I can do it on the projector here. So keep that circle in your mind. I hope you wrote it down because you know, that's actually quite important. It's one way to visualize what we are talking about in today's lecture. But I am going to give you an example in uh, in Joplin, because you know, this way I can just type it. Um, okay, right, so I want to look at a uh, calculation. So it is, okay, I'm gonna have to use uh, dot, 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 oh, four spaces first, one, two, three, four, and then we have one, two, three, four, again, and then we have one, 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 and I'm doing a subtraction, okay? So I'm trying to carry out a subtraction here. So now we have subtraction of um, zero, 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 one, zero, one, okay? Mm. Yeah, that will work, okay? So let me line up everything first. 
it's harder for me to type this in a table because you know things are more difficult to line up. Okay. And then we have this is gonna be our Q row. We did leave a few more spaces here. And then this is my um, K row. Or T row. This is going to be my D row. Okay, so you guys just have to focus on the right hand side. The left hand side of your circle just being aligned. Okay, so this is a good practice. How do we do binary subtraction? So let's go ahead and do, you know, perform this binary subtraction. And I need to put a dash, I guess, here to indicate this a subtraction. And for this particular one, we can assume T of zero is a zero to begin with. Okay, let's do this. What is, um, what goes here? What is one minus one? What is Q of zero? That is a, the entire row of Q is the exclusive or between the X and the Y. Okay, I just said something and you have to kind of think about this a little bit and ask yourselves, do I understand what Hack just said and where it is coming from? Let me say that one more time. The entire Q row is the exclusive OR between the X and the Y rows. And of course, I need to kind of tell you which one is the X. This is the X row, and this is the Y row, okay? So why is the Q row the exclusive OR between the X and the Y? Well, that's the whole thing on, on binary addition and subtraction. There's a whole long discussion you know, and logical explanation of how we can use exclusive OR to perform the R function. And the R function is what you need in order to compute Q of I from XI, YI. So there's a really long chain leading to that point, okay? And that chain is actually kind of important. Every link along the chain is important. So I'm gonna go like, oh, okay, so this is a, this is a zero because one exclusive OR with one is a zero. This one is a one because one exclusive or with zero is a one. This one is a zero again, and this one is a one again. I did not need to use arithmetic, arithmetic operation. All I did was to use exclusive or. So now that I know these numbers, I can now go back here and ask, what is T of one? By the way, T of one is over here. It is a subtraction, so we have to apply the B function. The B between the X0 and Y0 is the same thing as negating this one and it with this one over here. So we have not one and one, which is a zero. And then we apply the same thing over here, not zero, which is a one and zero, which is also a zero. So we have zero, zero. Those two zeros are ORed together because that's how T of I plus one is defined. So we have zero or zero and that result, which is also zero, so if this is all a little bit kind of strange to you, that means that you need to kind of go back to the binary addition and subtraction thing and practice and also you know, understand how everything links, you know, everything links. All right, so let's work on this one. So this one, it is going to be a zero as well because you know, what goes here is the OR. It's the OR of what? The negation of this one and this zero. The negation of a one is a zero, zero and zero is a zero. Or the negation of this one and this zero, the negation of a one is also a zero, zero and zero is also a zero. So now we have zero or zero, which is still a zero. So we put a zero here. And then this one is kind of the same deal, okay? That's also a zero. So by the time we get to the D row, which is the exclusive OR between the Q and the T, we just say zero exclusive of zero is a zero, one exclusive OR with zero is a one, zero, one again, okay? So we just work that out, but I, I missed the one carry bit or one T bit. There's one more carry uh, T bit over here, and that is also a zero. It is a zero because 
1 minus 0 has no ball of 1, 1 minus 0 has no ball of 1, and those two are or, so they have 0 or 0, which is also a 0. So when we get to the D row, okay, so I just mentioned how that is computed. 0 here, 1 here, 0 here, and a 1 here. So that's binary subtraction, okay? You know, I'm just using this as an, another opportunity to kind of remind you guys, you know, what binary subtraction is and the mechanism of binary subtraction. Okay, so what is the big deal here? Okay, the big deal here is, does signed versus unsigned matter? Okay, so let's take a look at signed versus unsigned. So I'm gonna put this out here, and I'm asking you, what is 1111 interpreted unsigned? You, you, you can look at the picture. What is 1111 as an unsigned value? 15, right? Okay, so we have 15 minus, uh, what is 0101? It's a five, very good. Um, and what is the result here? What is one zero one zero? Ten. Ten. Very good. Okay. There we go. Is that true? Fifteen minus five is a ten. That works out. Okay. Cool. So now we look at this as uh, using the signed interpretation. So using the signed interpretation, what is one 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 represented? Look at a circle. Negative one. negative one, very good. Okay, so we have negative one minus five because the five is still just a five over here. And what about one zero one zero? Look at the wheel. One zero one zero is down here. Okay, you guys know, you may, it, it is blocked from, from some of you. Let me move the chair again. Just because I like buttons. There you go. One zero one zero is what? Negative six. Okay. So let me put a negative six here. Okay. Is that working out for you? Negative one minus five is that negative six? That is why I asked the question earlier. What do you think? Because you don't have to. <laughs> well, if you don't have to care, why are we even talking about this? Are you just wasting my time and wasting air you know, in general? No, because there are occasions where you do care. When do you care is when you're comparing. Okay? So the reason why we care is not because of the arithmetic operation. It's not because of subtraction. It is not because of addition. It is because of comparison. Because now, if I ask you this question without any additional information, and I'm just asking you 1111 as a base 2 number, is it less than um, 0101 as a base 2 number? Now you have to scratch your head and go like, I can't really answer that question unless you tell me you know, which way I should interpret the numbers. Is it signed or is it unsigned? Because in the case of signed, 1111 is negative 1, 0101 is a 5, negative 1 is less than 5, yeah, it is true. But in the case of unsigned comparison, then the 1111 is representing 15, 0101 is still a 5, but 15 is less than 5 is false. Is that okay? So that means in the case of a comparison, like you know, if x is one of these four bits and y is the other the other one, then when you have if x is less than y, do blah blah, else do blah blah blah. Okay? In that case, it matters. We need to know. Are we interpreting the big pattern signed, which means you know, we use the the red values over here, or are we interpreting these as unsigned values, which means we're using the usual Okay, let me use blue again here. This is 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, and 8. So are we getting the general idea of when it matters and when it does not matter? Okay. All right. So now that we kind of get this part here, 
the next question is, so how do we find the negative, I mean, how do we find the representation of a value when we need to negate? For instance, I'll give you an example. Okay, I'm going to put it on the whiteboard here. So let's say, you know, what is the representation, binary representation of negative, I'm going to say negative 37 um, when W equals to, say, 32. Or 16, okay, good. That's, that's bad enough. I don't need to make it any worse. Okay. Okay, so this is the question. Okay, I want to find the signed representation of negative 37 when there are 16 bits. And you guys go like, oh, that's easy. We can just use the real approach again. Okay. How many spots do we have on that view, given that we have 16 bits? Let's see, with four bits, we have 16 slots. So with 16 bits, we're gonna have four times, you know, 16 times four, which is 64 slots. No, not even close, okay? How do we know that we have 16 slots over here, given that we have four bits? It has to do with the largest value unsigned that you can represent using four bits, which is, we talked about this earlier today. Two to the power of the number of bits. Not minus one, because zero takes a, it takes a slot two. So if you're counting the number of slots, it is just two to the power of W, which is the number of bits, okay? So two to the power of four is 16. What is two to the power of 16? Close. Did you say 32,000 something? Nope, it is 65,536. It is whatever you said times two. <laughs> okay, so who wants to draw a circle and put like 65,536 slots on it? And then count backwards to negative 37. That is not a very feasible approach. Does it work? Yes. Do you want to do it? Probably no. So what is the more general way of figuring this out, okay? So I'm gonna give you the easy solution and then we go back and look at why it works, okay? So the way it works is like this, okay? So I, I will show you exactly what to do with this particular example and then we'll go back and explain how that works. So the negation of 37 is, okay, let me use equations here. Negative or the negation of 37 is also known as the two's complement of the bit pattern representing 37, and this time in 16 bits. So can someone quickly tell me what is uh, 37 in binary? Okay, I, I, cannot, I cannot do it that quickly, so I'm gonna cheat here and use the whiteboard as a, as a post-it. It's 32 plus four plus one, right? So that means you know, we have I'm going to have to write the number backwards on the screen here. So we have 1, none of 2, 1 of 4, none of 8, none of 16, 1 of 32. Okay? So 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1 as a base 2 number already represents um, 37. But I need to pad it with a bunch of zeros because everything is 16 bit wide. So this is using how many digits already? Six of them. So I need to pad 10 zeros to the left hand side. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. There we go. So we are trying to figure out what we call the two's complement. So the idea of the concept of two's complement is it really is just doing the same thing as arithmetic negation but only for base two numbers, okay? Is that concept okay? Now, I just made a claim. I didn't quite get through how it works, but I just made a claim. Do we understand the claim itself? Arithmetic negation, which is what this minus is representing, is the same thing as the two's complement function, which I have not yet explained. So I'm just establishing that. Are we good? And then the 37 is in binary, in a 16-bit binary number, is a bunch of zeros, 10 of them, 
and then followed by one zero zero one zero one, and that's because we did the conversion a little bit earlier like that. Okay, so two's complement in return is defined as one's complement of the same bit pattern, one two three four five six seven eight nine ten one zero zero one zero one in base two plus one. Okay, great. You just define your one complement, which is your two's complement, as a one's complement of something. What exactly is one's complement? One's complement is also known as bitwise knot. Okay. The bitwise knot symbol is the tilde. So in C and C++, this is known as just the tilde uh, of the bit pattern, which is 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, in base 2. And the tilde did not show up here because it is has a special meaning in, oh, that doesn't work either. Uh, no, I think I have to t spell it out, tilde. Nope, <laughs> that doesn't like that either. Uh, okay, I have to go back to my notes. I have to cheat because I have to find out how I did it here. Um, right here. Sim. Who would know? I mean, why would it be called sim? Okay, find sim. Okay, and then plus one. Okay, don't forget the plus one because we forget to do that. Okay, so now the question is, what is tilde? What is bitwise not? What does it do? The easiest way to say it is you flip all the zeros into ones and all the ones into zeros. That's all it does. Okay, so then you look at this number here. Basically, it's all the zeros turn into ones and all the ones turn into zeros. It is known as a bitwise knot because we are applying logical knot to every bit position of the number. Isn't that one right there, four bits or whatever? Hmm? The one in four bits by itself right there? The one? Yeah, plus one. The, okay, this is a quantity of one that we need to add to whatever that is. So we haven't done the plus one yet. So that becomes what? Okay, so I have to be careful here. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, because we had 10 zeros before. Now we have 10 ones, because each zero turns into a one. And then we have 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, which turns into 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0 in base 2. And then still have to do the plus 1. OK? And the way it works out in terms of breaking the line, this works really to our advantage. <laughs> it just turns out this way. I didn't write it. You can see how all the every single bit here turn into the opposite of that same bit position. This is why it's called a bitwise not operation, because everything just turned to the opposite. Is that okay? So now we perform the actual you know, plus one. Okay, so now we have the final result here, which is uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, zero, one, one, zero, one, one in base two. Okay. This zero turns into this one because of the plus one. All right. Are we good okay so far with this? So what, what am I really claiming? I am claiming that in 16-bit 16 16 format, the quantity of negative 37, which is also known as the tooth complement of whatever bit pattern represents 37, this is representing negative 37. All right. And you guys are going like, uh, you can just throw a whole bunch of zeros and ones on the screen, and you can claim that it represents negative, negative 37. How can we know that it is representing negative 37? If I were you, I would ask that question in my head. <laughs> okay, because you should not trust your professor and go like, yeah, my professor is telling me this, I'm just going to write it down, it's just a fact. Always check it. But how do you check it? Aha. Uh -huh. 
you can convert it to base ten, but that's going to be really ugly because you have all these ones, right? So uh, what about this? What about I take the two's complement of this entire big pattern? What do you think I should get back? Okay, I, I'll, I'll present it here so that you know, we know exactly what we're dealing with. So if I were to take the two's complement of the number that we end up with, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1 in base 2, what do you think we should get back here? I claim that this is representing negative 37. I also claim that two's complement is the same thing as arithmetic negation. Yes. So the question is now, okay, do I get the original number back, which is 10 zeros and then followed by 100101? Zero, zero, one, zero, one. I think I made a mistake somewhere. Uh, maybe not. I think I, I'm good. Okay, so now we look at this and go like, okay, fine, we're going to do it the long way, which is one's complement of the same thing, 100111111111111. Zero one one zero one one in base two plus one. Okay, because the two's complement is one's complement plus one. Okay. Okay, what did that translate to? Okay, we have to apply the bitwise knot on the same bit pattern. Okay, one 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 zero one one zero one one in base two. I can imagine a Barney sound song made out of this entire derivation. <clears throat> If you don't know what Barney is, you know, well, it's okay. It's probably a good thing. Um, okay, so, you know, what does that translate to? Well, okay, the utility, and this utility operator, is really just saying um, all the ones turn into zero, all the zeros turn into ones, okay? So we're going to do that. So we get zero, 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 zero. Okay, am I missing one? Yep, okay. And then we have one zero zero one zero zero in base two, and then the plus one is still there. Okay, I forgot. Nope, I got, I got it. Focus on the right hand side. Are, are we still doing okay so far with where this is going? I hope so. Okay. So what is after the addition? What do we back? What do we get? What do we get back? One two three four five. One two three four five. One zero zero one zero one in base two, because we are adding one to this whole thing, and it becomes that. And magically, we got the original thing back, which is what value, it, what value was it representing? Let's double check, make sure that we didn't miss anything. This is one plus four plus no eight, no 16, 32. 32 plus four is a 36, 36 plus 1 is 37. We got our 37 back. Is that okay? Does everybody understand what just happened? Was I, okay, so let me scroll all the way back to what we where we started. So the original question was, I want to find the representation of negative 37. I know that two's complement is doing the same thing as arithmetic negation in base two using the signed representation. This part here is just 37. So that means you know, the two's complement of whatever is representing 37 should be the two should be the representation of negative 37. So the two's complement of something is defined as the one's complement of the same thing plus one. The one's complement of something is defined as the bitwise knot of that thing, which is simply flipping all the ones into zeros and all the zeros into ones. And then once we get this, we add the one to it, and we end up with this pattern here. So at this point, I, my claim is 
this big cavern here, the 16 big, big cavern, is the representation of negative 30 seconds. Is that, is that part okay? This is how we figure out what negative 37 would look like as a 16 bit signed integer. Is that part okay? So now I said, but I can just throw a bunch of zeros and ones on the screen and claim that is negative 37. How do I know that that really is negative 37? So I said, okay, let's do another arithmetic negation of negative 37. In other words, I'm asking, what is the arithmetic negation of negative 37? What is the answer in a math class, not in a computer science class? 37. You get 37 back, okay? Double negation doesn't do a single thing. They cancel out. So that's what I'm doing in the second part. So I'm taking the representation of negative 37, and I apply 2's complement to it. Because if, two, if 2's complement is doing what I tell you, I told you that it would do, which is do the same thing as arithmetic negation. The result of the two's complement and the binary representation of negative 37 should give me just 37 back. Is that okay? All right. So I went through the same process. I used the definition of two's complement, which is one's complement plus one. Okay, don't forget the plus one. And one's complement is the same thing as bitwise not, turning all the zeros to ones and all the ones into zeros. And then don't forget the plus one, okay? So I end up with this particular bit pattern after the bitwise not, don't forget the plus one. But once I add the one to the result of the uh, bitwise not, then I get this bit pattern here. And then I interpret this bit pattern again, and I got 37 back. Is that okay? So that's kind of the whole chain of explanation up to this point. What is the application? Well, the first application of this entire thing was to answer the question that I asked a little bit earlier. If I want to figure out what is the representation of negative 37 as a base two or binary number, this is how I figure it out without having to draw a gigantic circle and then make 65,536 slots out of it and then count backwards by 37, because that would have been the other way to do it. Instead of doing that, I just go like, oh, let's just do a bunch of bitwise operations and binary addition, and voila, we got the result. So that is the application of two's complement is when you know a certain negative value that you want to represent, and but you, it's easy to convert a non-negative value into base two because it's just a sum of powers of two. So we, we got that one done, right? So this is why you know, it's useful because if I give you a negative quantity, and if I ask you how do we represent that negative quantity in base two, given a certain number of bits, two's complement is how you do it. Are we good so far? All right. <clears throat> so I know it's almost time for you guys to do the lab, but I'm going to give you one more thing before you do the lab because you're going to need it. Okay, so the, these are the last two things. I know with more symbols and notations and whatnot, but the first one should not look foreign to you, okay? Look at the first one. Okay, let me use a mouse pointer to point to the first one. Does that look familiar to you? If you have been in this class for the past, what, 80 minutes or so, you go like, yes, we recognize this. This is exactly what we had earlier because that is the same thing as base conversion. This is how you compute the unsigned value and therefore the U over here, and that's what therefore the B over here, the unsigned value of a bit pattern X that has W bits in it. Is that okay? Okay, let me let me switch back to, to Joplin because you know, I want to remind you guys where we saw it in the first place today. It's right here. Okay, fine. I use D instead of X over here. Same idea. 
Okay, so this is nothing new. Okay, this is for if I give you a certain bit pattern and I say, okay, interpret that, that bit pattern up to W bits. This is how you figure out the value, the unsigned value of that bit pattern. The next one is for signed value interpretation. Why do we know that? Because instead of a U for unsigned, we have an S here for signed. So this is the signed value interpretation of X as a bit pattern up to W bits. So W is still the width of the bit pattern. You look at this and go like, isn't that almost the same? It is almost the same. Except the, the sigma notation only goes up to W minus two, which means we interpret all the bits using the sigma notation except for the most significant bit. Because the most significant bit is bit W minus one. And we are leaving that out of the sigma. Are we good so far? So that's the first difference. Then you guys go like, so where did that bit go? Are we using that bit for something? Yes, we are. We are subtracting instead of adding bit uh, W minus one times two to the power of W minus one from the sigma. Okay, so I'm going to give you an example on the whiteboard. Okay, so we'll take a look at the, the 1101, okay, as a four bit pattern. Okay, you go like, not that again. Yes, that again. Because we are so familiar with this bit pattern already, why not use it again, right? So I want to figure out what is the sign interpretation of this. This is how we apply BS, okay? We apply BS by actually you know, putting a bit pattern here and specify how wide we want to interpret for that particular bit pattern, all right? So can someone answer this question? What is, what is this translator? Well, we have one times one, right? Because you know, this one is a two to the power of zero. We have zero times two, because this two is two to the power of one. And then we have this one over here, which is um, one times two to the power of two, which is a four. So I'm just gonna write a four instead of two to the power of two. Right? But the sigma stops right here. Because W is, once again, what? W is four. And we are only using bit zero, bit one, bit two. We stop there. What about bit three? Bit three is a part of this number. What do we do with it? W is four, so bit three is here. We use bit three, multiply it by two to the power of three, and then subtract that amount from the rest, from the segment. So what are we subtracting here? We are subtracting this one, okay, times what? Two to the power of three, which is, come on, you guys know that. Two to the power of three is eight. eight. Very good. That is why we end up with a negative value. So now we have what? One plus four, the whole thing minus eight, which is a negative three. Does that match what we talked about earlier? Look to your, <laughs> look to your left, the big circle thing, is it consistent with the circle? Yep. So this is, so these are the equations that you use if I give you a certain bit pattern and I tell you this is supposed to be signed, this is supposed to be unsigned, this is how you figure out the value being represented by the bit pattern. Are we okay so far? Because these are the tools that you need for the lab today. I'm not taking a role today because I think the lab itself is also taking a role. Can we use that? All right, so are there any questions before we take a short break and then I'll let you guys do the, do the lab. Are there any questions? Questions, okay. So I'm gonna release the lab. You guys can go ahead and get started whenever you want to. But it's due at one, um, yeah, 120 is the, is the due date, or the time. So I'm gonna go back.
where are we? We are at. I skipped some labs and some discussions because I thought you know those are not as important, so they, those were skipped. So this is the lab. It's called you know just two's complement, and the access code is negative. So I'm gonna write it on the whiteboard too, so you guys can refer to it. Negative is the access code. And if you refresh your browser, you should be able to see the lab. I think the record yesterday, you know, because the, the class from yesterday did this too, I think the record was somebody got it done in like five minutes or something like this fast. It all depends on whether the material that we talked about today is sinking in. And that's really the whole purpose of the lab activity is for you, know, you to kind of exercise and practice what we talked today so you get a chance to actually do it you know, in, in practice. So I am going to get some water to drink and I'll be back in a few minutes. Stop the recorder, upload the video before I leave. 